Hello YouTubers, this is part 5 of my Knife Basics video series and this one is covering the parts of folding knife handles which are generally more complex and varied than fixed blade knife handles so this is going to be a fairly long video. And as I showed in part 4, a fixed blade handle starts with a tang which could even be the entire handle and then various materials are added to it to build it up. And since the folder's tang is part of the blade and is very short, there is no base to start with. So the handle has to be built from scratch. Now, there are many ways to build a folder handle, but there are only two things that are universal on all folders, and those are the pivot pin and the channel. And the pivot pin is what connects the two parts of the knife together. And as such, it's a vital part of the knife, which has to be strong enough to withstand a lot of abuse. If it's not, then the knife could very easily fail, creating an inconvenient or potentially dangerous situation. And pivot pins can either be rivets or some kind of screw. You can see rivets on your copy 907E and the old style large Voyager from Cold Steel. And pivot pin screws generally have either hex heads like on the Dalton Wings Custom Balisong or more commonly Torx head screws like on the Spartan and a lot of the other knives up here. And screws are generally more desirable than rivets for a couple of reasons. Um, first, they allow the knife to be taken apart for maintenance and cleaning. And second, they allow for tightening in the event that the knife develops any lateral play, provided you have the proper tools, of course. The only other universal part on folder handles is the channel, which is simply a groove or a space that accepts the edge and some of the blade when the knife is closed. And you will find a channel on every folder from the most simple to the most complex and even on balisongs. Another feature found on most folders is some kind of device to hold the knife open. But there are so many different styles of those, I'd hesitate to call them universal, and ancient folders didn't even have one at all. They just used tension from the handle on the tang to hold the knife open. And the simplest way to make a folder handle is to use a single piece of material, like polymer, or wood, or metal, or even two pieces stuck together with either molded or cut out channels. And then it needs a notch to accommodate the tang and a pivot pin. And then finally it needs a mechanism to hold the blade open. And the easiest way to do that, the simplest way, is the way it's done on twist locks. The twist locks just have a ferrule that turns to block the channel and prevent the knife from closing. Now that's about as simple as a folder can get. But notice that even on this handle there are at least three different parts. You have the pivot pin, the ferrule, and the handle material, which if you counted that as two pieces actually makes four pieces to that handle, as compared to the handle on this A.G. Russell Sting from CRKT. And you can see that even a simple folder handle is always more complex than a fixed blade handle. <clears throat> even these simple Okapi 907 and Kudu ratchet knives, which use a flat spring on the back to hold the knife open or closed, have five pieces. You have a pivot pin, the locking spring, a pin to hold that on, and handle material, and then a ring to manipulate the lock. 
So as simple as these handles are, many folding handles aren't even built that way. Most of them are actually built in layers and the best way I have to show you these layers is on this. The Cold Steel Espada XL. Now how crazy is this thing? But it's definitely big enough that you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. Originally the frame for a folder handle was these pieces of flat metal called liners. And the liners were kept apart by spacers as you can see on the back of this one. And then the whole thing was held together by pins. Then outside of the liners, uh, scales were added, and like on fixed blade handles, uh, scales can be made from all sorts of materials, uh, plastic or bone, antler, ivory, wood, ivory, steel, aluminum, or Velox or Valox, however you want to say that. And then those scales are either pinned or epoxied on, or both. And as you can see on this spot, sometimes bolsters are added, which, like on fixed blades, serve to strengthen the handle at the tang. And sometimes bolsters are also added at the butt end of the handle. And these usually add to the weight of the handle for balance, or they could simply be for cosmetics, or both. And that's also done on some fixed blade handles, by the way, um, for the same reasons, but I'm sure I forgot to mention that in the last video. And you can also see bolsters on this little Buck 301V at both the tang and the butt. And a lot of folder handles use spacers along the back of the liners to keep them apart. You can see some of these on the Recon 1 and the Cold Steel Spartan. And they show up really well on the tie light. However, some folders don't use spacers like this. Um, for example, the MTech Folding Stiletto uses pins to keep the two halves of the knife handle apart. And those pins are called standoffs. And when the back of the knife is open like this, it's called a sandwich design. Because like a sandwich, you can see what's between them from both the top and the bottom when the knife is closed. Also notice that some folders can have quillions as part of the handle. Now, this isn't actually a folder. It's actually a retracting automatic knife, and truth be told, it's also crap, as most of these things tend to be. Nevertheless, you can see it has quillions, and you can also find quillions on the classic Italian style <coughs> switchblade knife handles, which the tie light was designed to emulate. However, these quillions are on the tang. They're used as snaggers. And the same is true for the MTEX stiletto, which is designed to emulate the tie light. And I say emulate just to be nice. But in any event, the point is that some knives, like the Italian switchblades, have quillions which are actually part of the handle. And while I'm covering handles, I want to point out that some knives have this deep finger groove as a design feature and that's exactly what that is it's a finger groove these are part of the handle and they're not part of the blade so they're not choils and don't make the mistake of calling them choils which I have heard people do now early I said that this is how a lot of folders handles were originally made but today because handle materials like polymers are so much stronger some manufacturers don't use liners anymore and on these knives like the older Voyager the scales actually become the basis for the handle and the new Voyagers actually do have liners by the way and this bird 
flight um, is actually made from metal so basically technically it's actually liners without any scales but because they don't actually line anything we just call that metal frame and butterfly knives may or may not have liners if they're polymer and they may or may not have scales if they're metal and like other folders bow song handles can either be spacered or sandwiched or half and half like on the Dalton knife and they could also just be one piece of material with a channel machine out of it. Okay, I think that pretty much covers the build of most folding knife handles. So now I need to talk about the ways that the blade is kept open on a folder. And notice I didn't say lock because all folders don't actually lock open. And I mentioned before that the ancient folders, which were called peasant knives or penny knives, weren't held open by anything except from the tension on the tang from the handle. And yeah, they were pretty primitive, but there are actually still knives made like that today. Um, a more advanced handle that doesn't actually lock is the slip joint. And like the Victorinox Swiss Army knife and on um, the Buck 301V. Now on these knives, the spacers are metal and they're pinned at the butt end and somewhere along the middle and that leaves the near end free to bend like a leaf spring as you can see happening here and when the knife is open it rests on the back of the tang and puts downward pressure on it um, but while there is tension keeping the blade open the knife isn't actually locked because you can still close it without manipulating anything. Okay, and the simplest lock knife is the twist lock, which I talked about before. And on these knives, the lock doesn't actually engage the blade in any way, it just blocks the channel so the knife can't close. And then after that is these flat spring locks. On, like on the ratchet knives and old Navajo knives and um, these locks engage a, lock, a lug on the tang through a hole which actually has to be lifted off the lug in order to close the knife next there's the traditional lock back it's like this old Voyager which was developed by buck knives back in the 1960s and on these knives there's a locking bar which has a hook on one end down by the uh, tang and there's a leaf spring under it in, in the back and then there's a pin in the middle and like a slip joint this bar raises at the front but instead of just tension on the tang it actually holds the hook down in the notch on that blade and you can see a very good example of that notch on this espada see right here and that's what locks into that locking bar and then of course the lock has to be depressed in order to lift the hook out of the tang and let the knife close Cold Steel has modified the basic lock back with an innovation from knife maker Michael Demko and they call that the triad lock and basically what they've done is they put a stop pin behind the blade and in front of the locking bar and this stop pin stops the blade from trying to move further back and hitting that locking bar under vertical stresses like when the knife is used to chop and that disperses the impact into the handle 
and prevents it from hitting that locking bar and potentially damaging it. And Cole Steel claims that it's the strongest lock in the business. And there's probably some truth to that. Uh, there have been some complaints about the Triad being very stiff though, especially when it's new and particularly on the Spartan. But it does wear in after time and gets much easier with some use. So that's not really that big a deal. Now another type of lock is the Walker Liner Lock, which was developed by another knife maker, um, Michael Walker. And on these locks, the liner acts as a leaf spring and it bends in to block the tang. And this is a good example of one on this cold steel tie light. And to close the knife, the liner is pushed into the side and unblocks the tang and allows the knife to close. Now, since some knives don't have liners, um, they use a variation of the walker lock, which is the frame lock. And frame locks work the same way as liner locks, but a section of the um, frame is actually cut out, and it acts as the leaf spring. And liner locks and frame locks vary in quality, and whatever blocks that tang should be very sturdy, very beefy in order to be trusted. And that's a really good one on that tie light. You can see it's very thick and it completely blocks that tang. Um, the liner lock on this Mtex Stiletto is actually fairly thin and if it moved over just a little bit it might be enough to let that tang slip by and the knife would accidentally close on your fingers. And that definitely wouldn't be good. Right. Balasongs have a T-latch that locks the two parts of the handle together, either in the open or in the closed position. And for a really good explanation of how these work, check out Cutlery Lover's review on the Benchmade Model 51 Morpho. And he did a great job explaining how Balasong T-latch works, and I don't really have a lot time to go into that in detail in this video. So if you really want to see that, check out Cutler Lover's video. Now, like snagging devices, there are more and more locks being developed for the tactical folder market. And you have various bolt action locks and ram locks and auto locks and cam locks. And for example, this Recon 1 has the bench made access lock and Cold Steel call this a ultra lock that's what an ultra lock but they really paid Benchmade to use that lock so it's an access lock and this lock has a bar that goes through a L-shaped hole in the tang and when it's in the forward position it locks the knife open and when it's pulled back it actually travels down the other leg of that L and allows the knife to close. And that's another extremely strong lock. But Cold Steel doesn't use it anymore since they've gone to their, their own triad lock. And there are way too many locks for me to cover here. And I certainly don't have examples of all of them. So whatever kind of lock you do end up getting, just make sure that you get completely familiar with it. And the term tactical folder, that refers to knives that claim to deploy fast enough and to be strong enough and to be reliable enough that you can depend on them to save your life without failing. And I just need to point out that the more complicated a folder handle is, the more parts it has. And the more parts it has, the greater the chance that just one of those could fail causing the entire knife to fail. If the pivot pin breaks, or if the tang notch or the locking bar hook break, or if the leaf spring or the scales that don't have liners break, or any number of things, that entire knife can fail. And 
So no folder will ever be as dependable as a high quality fixed blade with a full tang. Okay. If the scales failed on a fixed blade, or if the handle material broke, or the pommel came off, or whatever, um, you could still use that knife if it has a sturdy full tang to hold on to. And that's not necessarily the case with folders, so always keep that in mind. Okay, that's the end of part five. Uh, I really had no idea how big this project was going to get. But I do have one more um, to do on hardness, toughness, and burrs. So keep an eye out for that. And thanks for watching.